Good afternoon. You've joined us uh, here for Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. And uh, we're playing, playing the game a little differently today. I'm flying solo. Uh, and I thought, since I uh, was doing that, that I'd have to talk about a, a topic of some interest and what would be more interesting than sex. So uh, I was going to uh, delve into sex in a likable science sort of way and talk a little bit about some work I used to do. Uh, many years ago, I, was in, in a, uh, I worked in a laboratory that uh, studied reptile sex. And reptiles play a lot of interesting games with, with sex. And really what, what I want to do uh, today is, is tell you about several of the model systems that we, that we work with, sort of go into a little detail on them, why they're sort of interesting. But I hope you'll walk away with a little bit of a sense that, that although this seems like very obscure sort of research, um, it, it really is actually uh, telling us a lot about the, the nature of the world around us, about why animals behave the way they do, which ultimately tells us about why people behave the way we do. And as such, it really is actually valuable. I, I think there's a certain amount of science research that is not well understood that seems very obscure to people. People tend to belittle it or poo-poo it and suggest it has no relevance to the real world. And I, I hope perhaps today you'll, you'll get a sense of how seemingly sort of odd and obscure research may actually uh, be of some value. And at the same time, I, I do hope as, as usual that we'll find something likable about it. So this work took place uh, back uh, many, uh, many years ago in the laboratory of Dr. David Cruz at the University of Texas. Uh, Dr. Cruz is a well-known herpetologist in the Department of Zoology there and works with a uh, uh, a set of colleagues in a, in a, a special interest group called the uh, uh, Institute for Reproductive Biology at that point. Um, so he was very interested in uh, looking at some of the environmental constraints that, that uh, some reptiles uh, endure and how this influences their behavior. And one of the animals we studied was an animal called the red-sided garter snake. Now, I hope most people are familiar with garter snakes, and the red-sided garter snakes look pretty much like any other garter snake. They're long, skinny, have sort of green and black stripes down their back. Um, very common garter snakes all around. The red-sided garter snakes have some small red dots along their sides, little red scales, but look other than that pretty much like a, a standard garter snake. The difference with these beasts is they live up in Manitoba, Canada. They live in, quite far north, about as far north as any reptiles do. And this puts some very uh, interesting limits on what they do, because for about seven or eight months a year, they have to be hibernating underground. And this, this means, of course, they can't be moving around, they can't be eating, they can't really be doing anything other than just sort of existing in a, in a very sluggish state. Yeah, there is a very nice picture of some red-sided garter snakes that, that are, uh, our uh, producer, Izuri, has uh, uh, very nicely located. Um, so so these, uh, these uh, red-sided garter snakes, they've got this, this system. So how, the question sort of was, how do they then reproduce? They only, only have four months of the year when they can be active, when the moms can be uh, uh, growing the young inside them. They have to grow the young, they have to uh, hatch the young. Uh, and then they have to eat and get back into a den, all within this little four month window. And how do the snakes do it? So their behavior is really rather interesting. Every spring, uh, as, as the temperatures gradually rise, the male snakes come out of hibernation at slightly lower, at slightly colder temperatures than the females. So out of these dens, which are basically cracks and crevices in rocky hillsides, the male snakes will come out and rest on these hillsides, uh, rest on, the, on the, the rocks. And gradually one or two males will emerge and more dozens and hundreds of males, thousands of males. And it's all male garter snakes at first, just hanging out, waiting on these rocks. And then as the temperature gradually gets a little warmer, finally there comes a day when a, a female or two emerges. The females, when they emerge, are extremely attractive and this picture uh, here actually shows the, what happens when an extremely attractive female garter snake emerges. All the males around go crazy and start trying to have sex with her. And literally they, they form what are called mating balls, where dozens to hundreds of snakes are there, typically one female in the middle, all the rest males, 
all the males competing, trying their best to mate with this one female snake. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating process. Uh, what it, the, the interesting behavioral part of it is that right after one male is successful at mating, the female very rapidly, within a matter of a few moments, becomes very unattractive to the males. And the males immediately leave her alone. And then she is now impregnated right away, the, sort of the first moment she was able to get pregnant. She has gotten pregnant. The males no longer want anything to do with her. They leave her alone. She goes off, can hunt, can eat food, can, can uh, uh, nurture her young uh, as rapidly as possible. It gives her for the maximum time to do this. And the question was, of course, well, how does this whole system work? Why are the females so attractive to the males? Uh, why they suddenly turn unattractive? And the answer lies in chemistry. Uh, many people who have who looked at snakes have seen the snake's tongue flicking behavior. The snakes flick out their little forked tongues, tap them lightly on, on the ground in front of them, and withdraw the, the tongue back into the mouth. That's, uh, that tongue picks up uh, chemicals, uh, tiny pieces of dust, dirt, whatever has chemi chemicals on it, flicks back into the mouth and, and it's actually pressed up into the top of the mouth where there are some chemical sensors. It is a different chemical sense. It's not taste and it's not smell, but it's sort of a sense you might think of in between the two. And, and these snakes put out what are called pheromones. And many people have heard of pheromones. These are chemicals that animals put out that, that have certain signals to the others of their kind. And it turns out when the females are emerging from a long period of hibernation, they are exuding a, a sex attractant pheromone, a, a, fer, a chemical that drives the male snakes batty with desire, uh, makes them absolutely want, want to uh, approach this and, and breed with this. This effect is so strong that you can take an, an attractive female, wipe the back of her with a paper towel, put that paper towel down in front of male snakes who have come out of hibernation recently, and the male snakes will attempt to copulate vigorously with a paper towel. They will get on top of it, they will writhe around, they, they will do all the classic, their classic mating behaviors in the complete absence of a female snake simply on this paper towel uh, because they are being driven by their chemical sense to, to breed. And, but the, actually the act of then, the act of copulation actually changes the female's brain and she, she stops producing this attractant pheromone and begins indeed to produce a, a, a different substance that is actually a repellent pheromone. And the male snakes don't like this, they, they shy away from it. Indeed, if they're forced to be around it, they themselves become sort of asexual. They can no longer uh, get interested in females. Uh, so uh, that's of course for their reproductive uh, interests, that's, that's no good at all. So. Um, we were studying these the snakes uh, and, and trying to understand this system and, and, and how it actually worked and, and look at the, the beautiful way that nature has figured out how to overcome an obstacle when, when the, the time uh, allowed uh, to breed is so short and, and the, the, the whole life cycle of the, of the snake, the whole annual cycle has to be compressed in three or four months. How do they get around that limit? How do they uh, push their system so, so much? And these red-sided garter snakes in Canada figured out a, a truly interesting way to do it. Um, I should point out that, that working on snakes like this has a certain amount of uh, 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 interest to it. Uh, when we would bring uh, the batch of these snakes back from Canada, uh, there, were, there were whole interesting stories from David's uh, lab people who collected them in Canada about trying to come back into the U.S. carrying large containers full of snakes. And, uh, U.S. border authorities typically thought that was a very odd thing to be doing, but at some point uh, each year, we would then be there, all the snakes, would, the female would start having their young, and it was important to separate the males and females very early, so we would have these long days when we'd sit there and sex baby snakes. And so you would reach into a bucket and pull out a little squirmy baby snake, perhaps three or four inches long. You, you have to look at it, you have to press on its, on its abdomen and, and see if you can uh, evert the hemipenes that these, the males have a, uh, a bifurcated penis actually. So, uh, and you can, you can force that out and if you could, you drop them in one bucket. And if you couldn't, then you assume it's a female and drop it in the other bucket. And after you've done this for a few hours, if you make a mistake and you realize that you just dropped one, you dropped a male snake in the female bucket or vice versa, 
it's, it's, it's of course a huge hassle because you have to go back and start all over again and the snakes are squirming and they're exuding all sorts of smelly materials and, and it's just uh, one, of the, one of those things that makes science research so special. You know? So that was one of the, one of the models that, that uh, we studied and it's, it's an interesting uh, look at how some reptiles uh, work with, with sex. Uh, another model we looked at was, was that of a phenomenon called temperature dependent sex determination. TSD, as a lot of people uh, in, in, in the business call it. Now, we as, as humans, and when we look at most animals, we assume they're either born as male or they're born as female. Uh, and that's sort of the end of the discussion. But among the reptiles, at several points, sex is not determined chromosomally. That is, uh, in male, male uh, animals, typically, the sex chromosomes are said to be X and Y, whereas females have two X chromosomes. Uh, many of the reptiles don't have this kind of uh, genomically determined sex. They have a temperature-dependent determined sex. And what that means is that whether, this, whether an animal ends up male or female depends on what temperature it experienced while in some part of its incubation phase, while it was uh, typically in an egg or uh, uh, inside, its, uh, its, its being, its inside its incubation conditions. And interestingly, it's been shown this phenomenon of temperature-dependent sex determination uh, arose several times independently because it occurs in the, uh, the crocodilians, that is, the alligators and crocodiles exhibit it, uh, some lizards exhibit it, and some turtles exhibit it. And it, it doesn't go the same way. In, in, uh, for instance, in the lizards that, that we studied, the leopard geckos, uh, higher temperatures lead to males and lower temperatures lead to females. Uh, but I, I, in, in some of the turtles, as I recall, that, that is absolutely reversed. The higher temperatures lead to males and lower temperatures lead to females. Uh, I mean, vice versa. Anyhow, it, 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 it's pretty clear this has evolved very differently um, and, uh, over, over uh, evolutionary spans of time. But it's clearly an, uh, an important way that reptiles determine their sex. And, and um, it has very interesting tie-ins to the uh, changing climates now because think if you if your uh, maleness or femaleness is determined by the temperature at which you're incubated and the temperature of the world around you is rising that means of course that the population may gradually shift to become all male or all female unless there is perhaps some adjustment that can be made and that's actually a current uh, topic of considerable interest to, to scientists uh, who look at these animals is are they adjusting to to a changing uh, and a rising temperature regime? Are they shifting their own set point temperatures uh, so that they, they keep the population balanced? Because cl clearly, uh, in general, you don't want a population that is either all female or all male. That, that's just not, not going to work at all. Um, we're going to take a short break, but I will be uh, right back after that and uh, go into this, uh, the, these uh, 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 sex, uh, temperature dependent sex determination a little bit further after our break. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in, check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. So come around, we'll see you then. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet, Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. And we're back here on Likeable Science. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we're talking about uh, reptile sex. It, uh, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, I hope uh, folks are as interested in it as I was many years ago when I studied it. And um, I, I was talking about the work I had done in, in, well, in David Cruz's lab at the University of Texas in Austin. I told you about the uh, uh, red-sided garter snakes that exhibit the, uh, a sort of compressed reproductive cycle and, and how that happens and the, the sex pheromones that drive it. The, uh, 
next animal I want to talk about is, uh, has this temperature-dependent sex determination. And these are leopard geckos. Leopard geckos are uh, a medium-sized uh, gecko. They would range to, to five, six, maybe even eight inches long, a big one. Um, pale with dark spots, which is why I think I call leopard geckos. And as is the habit with uh, uh, lizards who exhibit temperature-dependent sex determination, high temperatures lead to male geckos, and low temperatures during the middle third of incubation lead to female geckos. Yeah, in our, this picture now shows some uh, very pretty little leopard geckos, lovely animals. Um, since uh, we were trying to understand the mechanisms of this temperature-dependent sex determination, one of the experiments that David Cruz uh, set up was to incubate gecko eggs at sort of intermediate temperatures. What happens if they're a little bit warmer than is ideal for a female, but not yet hot enough to, to produce a male uh, gecko? And the results were actually quite intriguing. At, at some intermediate point, the, the geckos begin to masculinize. And when I say begin to, their brain switches over, apparently, and they grow up believing that they are males and thinking as a male gecko does, but because the temperature hasn't been quite high enough to make them all the way male, they still appear to other geckos to be female. And so this, of course, leads to very interesting encounters in the wild, that, that is, they will approach uh, female geckos as a male, but to the female they appear to be another female who's just behaving very strangely. Uh, furthermore, other male geckos then approach them, thinking they are females, but they don't respond as a female. They respond as another male and challenge him back. Uh, and so naturally, these, these animals are not terribly uh, successful at reproduction. Uh, they uh, uh, they, they uh, fail rather badly. Um, the picture here shows a, a bit about the, what I was talking about earlier, about, about the hemipenes uh, of uh, uh, reptiles uh, and, and how you can actually sex some, uh, some reptiles there. Uh, it's a, a messy business, but uh, the, the reptiles uh, do it. And do, it, and do it reasonably well. So um, th that was uh, quite interesting work with, with the, the leopard geckos that we were doing. The uh, climate change stuff that I mentioned earlier, there, there appears to be some evidence that, that these animals can adjust by the by. Uh, some of the sea turtles are, uh, show temperature dependent sex determination. And some of them that live at rather different latitudes uh, have different sort of threshold temperatures where, where they, they make the male to female shift and even within the same species. So it appears there is some capacity to, uh, to, to adjust to, to an environment. And so we are hopeful, cautiously optimistic, that even as our planet warms, this will not cause the, the immediate extinction of, for instance, uh, certain kinds of sea turtles by simply uh, reducing them to a single sex, which will uh, generally, uh, of course, uh, wipe out a population. And, and that actually leads us to the, the third model I want to talk about because, I, you, you may know what I said, generally leads to extinction. This third model was, was a very interesting group of so-called nemedophorous lizards. And these are skinny little whiptail tail lizards, or they're sometimes called. Uh, a rather, in contrast to the gecko, these are rather slim, lightly built, uh, very rapid moving lizards. There's quite a few families, or quite a few species of whiptail tail lizards all around. Uh, they often favor uh, disturbed habitats, uh, open, sort of open grassland kind of habitats um, that may be subject to fires and, and, and other sorts of disruption fairly rapidly. This one particular species is apparently uh, has been genetically found to be a rather new species, uh, relatively recently uh, evolved. And what's interesting about it is that the species uh, of this so-called Nemedophrys uniparens uh, is that the whole species are all females. There are no males. Furthermore, the whole species are actually all identical females. These females each produce eggs that are essentially clones of themselves, and therefore they are all essentially identical sisters, this, this whole entire species. There are no males. There are no other females. There's only essentially one female uh, who's just copied many, many times now uh, across the, the uh, uh, New Mexico, uh, West Texas area, uh, even, I guess, over into Arizona, too. And they raise a very interesting question. Uh, this looks like a rather uh, a very different uh, 
emidophorous lizard that, that uh, doesn't really look like our uniparans, uh, nor, nor its parental species, but um, it's, it, it certainly shows a, a, nice, a nice image of an emidophorous. Um, so the question sort of is, uh, one, well, there's a couple of questions. One, why are these animals asexual? Why is the whole species made up only of females? And furthermore, how does this work? So if you keep these nematophorous lizards uh, in isolation, they crank out a, a, a few eggs every now and again. They'll, they'll drop two or three or four eggs uh, every, I think, and I, might, uh, I might be getting the time frame a little bit wrong, but roughly every month or so. Um, these eggs, I say, are, are exactly like the females. I should point out these lizards are not, um, they are genetically very different than we are, obviously, because if they can produce by themselves, they can produce unfertilized eggs that are viable. These lizards are, are actually triploid, that is, and opposed to the standard diploid state. We are, we are said to be diploid. We have, uh, as I mentioned, an X and a Y chromosome. Yes, there's a, a much more normal looking nematophorous lizard. Uh, we are diploid, that is, we have uh, uh, two sets of chromosomes, and our sex chromosomes are different between males and females, X and Y. These lizards are all triploid. They have three sets of chromosomes, but they're all Xs in terms of sex chromosome. They're all females. Uh, every female produces uh, young that are exactly like her um, and uh, exactly like all the other nem nematophorous lizards. What's really intriguing, though, is we know these lizards have ancestral species that are still around, and we've, uh, in the cruise lab, we also looked at some of these other species, and they have very clearly sort of normal sex behavior. So, uh, and, and for a lizard, a uh, nematophorous lizard, the normal sex behavior is, is sort of interesting. The, a male will approach a female, mount her on top of her, and then he will wrap himself around, literally turn his body perpendicular to hers, and wrap in a, in a what we refer to as a donut posture, around her, uh, literally with his back end sort of off one side trying to copulate with her and his front end wrapped over her pelvis reaching around to the other side. Very uh, stereotype behavior like this, uh, like what's being shown here. This is a classic nematophorous uh, donut behavior. And so while, while there are ancestral species that have males and females do this, if you put two of these triploid uniparans females together, after a little bit, one of them will start doing this to the other one. One of them will start behaving like a male. She will chase the other one. She will mount it. She will wrap herself in a donut position around it and pseudo copulate with her. And what this does, it, it stimulates the other, other lizard to lay more eggs. This is her, her now female partner will lay more eggs more often. And if you keep them together, what you find is about every two weeks, they shift. So the, the one who was being male becomes female, as it were, and the one who was, was playing the female role now is playing the dominant male role, chasing the other lizard around, mounting her, wrapping around in her donut posture, doing the whole pseudo copulation on her. Um, and this is all actually driven by uh, their hormones. In this case, uh, the progesterone, uh, one of the standard circulating female hormones that, that cycles in a regular pattern, uh, acts like testosterone. Uh, and so when progesterone is high in these lizards, they start behaving like males. When, test when progesterone is low, they'll behave like females. And when you put two of them together, they get per perfectly out of sync, out, out of phase with one another after a little bit. Uh, again, through their, probably through very keen chemical senses. So this is, uh, you know, uh, yet another example of some of the strange ways that, that reptiles uh, play with sex. Reptiles aren't the only odd group to, to do this. Um, and there's still much more that is not well understood about, about reptile sex. Uh, a few years ago, a female python who had been in captivity by herself for some 10 to 15 years uh, began laying eggs. And uh, this is not seen typically, uh, as far as I could tell, these were viable eggs. And it was, uh, so again, it just goes to show uh, the, 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 these pythons are not thought to be uh, any sort of uh, self uh, parthenogenic reproducers. You know, um, just goes to show there's a lot we don't know. It, but it's not confined to, to reptiles. Uh, lots of other groups play interesting games with sex. Uh, a lot of fish do very interesting things with sex. Uh, some fish, for instance, when they're small, they're males. As they grow up to beyond a certain size, 
later in their life they become females. Um, there are some fish that do just the other thing. There are uh, various animals that, that, that are hermaphroditic, are male and female at the same time in their life. Um, so there's a wonderful fish where the males, uh, it's a deep sea fish, the angler fish, where the males start out as very small, they swim around, they find a large female, bite on her flank, and they essentially then stop growing. They merge, literally merge with the female, lose everything about themselves, this becomes sort of merged with her. Their, their circulation is now driven by her. Uh, even their nervous system is controlled by her, so she can control when, when the gonads, which are the only thing that are left working in these tiny males, uh, she can control when, when they release sperm and uh, thus carries around a number of different males, and she can, at her choice, uh, get fertilized by any of them. So there is, yes, beautiful picture, lovely picture. Our, our very talented producer, Zuri, has found a picture of the little, little male uh, anglerfish there latched onto a female. Uh, literally, he's grown into her. His mouth parts have fused with her tissues. Her circulation now feeds him. He, doesn't, he never can leave. Uh, he uh, is nourished by her. Her blood circulates through his veins. Uh, and, and she can tell him what, you know, when, when, to, when to release sperm. So uh, while this all does seem sort of like obscure research, it seems you, you could sort of say, who cares? But it really tells us that there are very interesting things going on with, with, uh, with animal reproduction, that there are, there's, sort of, there's more than one way to skin a cat, as the old saying goes. Uh, there, there are lots of different ways to look at sex. There are lots of different controlling factors for it. It can be controlled by the environment as in the, the red-sided garter snakes. Uh, it can be controlled by the temperature of the environment you were uh, incubated at, as in, as in the lizards. Uh, you, you can, if you, if you want, as it were, with the Nemedophorus lizards, uh, you, can, you can throw away one of the sexes and maintain a parthenogenic female clonal line. Um, so lo lots of interesting things going on. Uh, a fascinating uh, uh, field of study uh, with, with, I hope, uh, some, some interest and so that's uh, my little, hopefully, uh, take home lesson for people today is that, is that even some of the most obscure science can be likable science. I hope you'll join me again next week. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likable Science. We'll be back in a week.